Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lone House Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. Today we have one of the best interviews that we have ever done. It is with Dr. Woody Lane. Dr. Lane is a world-renowned animal nutritionist, forage and grazing specialist. We are very fortunate to have him with us today. Regardless of if you raise sheep, goats, or other ruminants, you are going to find parts of this video very beneficial. Dr. Lane is also an author of multiple books, a third book which is coming out soon, and we will talk about that during our interview. If you're interested in purchasing any of his books or are interested in contacting him, please check out the description below. Without delay, let's get started on our interview with Dr. Woody Lane. You're a well-known livestock nutritionist here in the United States. You're a specialist in forage uh, and grazing. And then the two books, right? So we've got the 2014, which is from the feed trough. Now that is more of a uh, compilation of essays, right? Yes. Okay. They're both. They both are. They both have the okay. same format relative. I have been writing for the Shepherd magazine right. since 1993. Yep. I read it. And I just read one of your articles this morning. So. Well, the ones I'm printing now are not new ones. I saw then, that. I saw it was from 2000. I stopped writing about two years ago because I'm trying to retire. But right. the, the end result, though, is that uh, I had over 311 articles. Wow. And you know what happens in a magazine. You write an article, it's in the magazine, and three months later, nobody remembers it because it's gone. It's, it's off the desk. And right. I've put, I'm, what I've done is I've put them together in right. a way and uh the one from the feed trough is prime is primarily nutrition and very heavily sheep very okay. you know there's whole things about various s aspects of early weaning lambs and as well but the principles apply to everything nutrition i mean you know proteins protein etc cetera, etc cetera, vitamins and minerals the one on this one here is on forages and grazing capturing and sunlight right that's capturing a sunlight well it is book one See right up here says book I one. I noticed that. I noticed that. Book two is coming out. I'm finishing up right now. Okay. Uh, how literally. how many books are you thinking in the series? Well, that's <laughs> since these take years to put together. Uh, right now, just book one and book two. Okay. In this series, I've got there's still others. I've got a potential book on on the on the farmer discussion groups that I've worked with. Then then there's a would be a. Uh, a collection of those that I hadn't published yet. Things on genetics. I wrote a number of articles of uh, dialogues in the confused chromosome club. Tell, tell so, me, uh, tell me about about you growing up. I'm when you went to university. Did you did you go to university saying this is what I'm going to do, or did this kind of evolve? I did not grow up on a farm. So uh, how how did, how did this manifest then? Well. Uh, I I went to university. I grew up in New York City, and I went to university at Syracuse University. That's for my bachelor's, and I was interested in nature and biology and whatever. And I was just you know I got like good grades, but it was the time of the Vietnam War, and uh, I wanted to do something and help people. I decided that in my senior year, when I was finally trying to make decisions, I wanted to make the world a better place. I mean that sounds kind of kind of you know well kind of simple and, and idealistic, but you know, when you're a senior in college, you can be idealistic and not know that there's a problem with that. And I wanted to do something good and I didn't want to just get into business or move paper or anything. And then there was a war and I decided I went into the Peace Corps. And so I went into the Peace Corps. I was in Southeast Asia and Malaysia on the island of Borneo for two and a half years. And when I was on my way home, it was going to be winter here. <laughs> and I decided to go where there wasn't a winter for a few months. And I went to New Zealand and I spent six months in New Zealand. And there I talked my way onto farms and work with various, just for free, just please, whatever I'm worth. And that's what I did for five, six months. And I worked on a couple of different farms and, and there were livestock farms with grass. Uh, I mean, I was a shearing crew for a week when the shearers came in and I didn't know anything, but I helped out and, you know, as a rouseabout and I, and I helped move animals and did stuff I had never done before. And I loved it. And I thought working in farming, being on the land, producing food and fiber, what a worthwhile thing could that be? As opposed to doing something in a, in a large city and producing some product that people probably wouldn't need or anything. But working with food and fiber and whatever, I milk cows, uh, was that's what I wanted to do. 
I went back to work for a couple of years in, in the city, but then self-financed myself to Cornell and went, and went into Cornell. And I actually wanted to learn how to drive a tractor. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. I'd worked on a farm in Vermont for a little bit, but my advisor saw a greater potential than just being a farm worker. And, and I started to work in graduate work and went straight A across. One thing led to another did the research, got a master's, and things had changed and matured professionally and worked in the Allegheny, went to West Virginia and worked on the Allegheny Hans Project, which is a very famous, well, team approach project in the mountains of West Virginia um, for two years, and then did some shearing for a bit and then came back to Cornell and got a doctorate. That's how one thing led to another. But I started from a place that was not your classic fifth generation farmer anywhere. Right. So, so was your first exposure, real true exposure to sheep was it actually overseas? Uh, before? In New Zealand. So most people <laughs> grew up on a farm around, you know, United States. They're used, they, they raised them. Your first experience was completely different. How has your exposure to sheep production overseas affected the way you approach it here in the States? Do you feel like, do you feel like they have a much different approach to it than we do? Yeah. Or yeah. Tell, tell me about that. Well, firstly, it was, it was traditional in the sense that it was based on grass. They didn't put grain to animals. They sold them very similar to what would, had they had done in England for hundreds of years. But in New Zealand, you could grow forage. And what I saw were people who had, well, at that point, it wasn't four-wheelers. They used horses. <laughs> right. but, but still, the concept is moving mobs of sheep of 500, 1,000 ewes or whatever, uh, and using stock dogs, huntaways, and, and headers. Uh, animals that uh, they were to me that was fascinating but it was so back to the earth it was so uh, solid with what was growing and they produced a high quality product they still do and in New Zealand lamb is still lamb it's under a year old not so much here it's not at all and I thought of the honesty and integrity of what they were doing and how they were doing it and in the United States, things are changing here. Over the whole regenerative agriculture is duplicating what they did there, and I'm, we're not copying somewhere else here. And don't get me wrong, we're not copying right. it. But there's a whole movement that basically is doing the types of things that I first saw and thought were so important was to uh, work with the land and work with the, the the animals on the land. And I thought that was the way in which animals can be done. And now as, as a nutritionist, and I've learned considerably what the ruminant can do, it's the most ethical thing I can think of in working on the land. I mean, these plants capture sunlight, so to speak. Uh, they do. And we can convert that to, to food. Sure. And not only that, it does not compete with humans because ruminants can do something that humans can't. I mean, the number one feedstuff in the world in terms of tonnage in the world is fiber, primarily cellulose, and it's causing it hemicellulose. And we, as monogastrics, as animals without rumens, chewing tobacco doesn't count as chewing cut, okay? Right, right. But we, as we have the same digestive tract that dogs and cats do, all right? The one enz enzymes that we don't have is we don't have enzymes to digest cellulose. We cannot digest much. Fiber. Now, in our lower tract, we can digest a little bit of it. Fair enough. But we couldn't live on alfalfa, for example. I mean, you couldn't. We can digest some. We eat lettuce, right? I mean, some fiber we can digest. it, But it's a very small amount compared to animals that are designed that way. And the, the ones that are designed the most are ruminants. Sheep, cattle, bison. Hor horses aren't ruminants. But still, they've got a large, large lower tract, and they can they can handle that obviously. But the thing is, is that what's forage? What's those grasslands? It's primarily fiber, and we can live. Uh, I mean, animals. Uh, we can raise animals that that can properly and very efficiently use all of that and produce obviously human food, human fiber, milk, meat, wool, and we can do that. And I think it's an ethical proper way of handling things and if you look at the other poultry and hogs those animals compete directly for human food they do not live on hay and forage you could put a little bit in the diets of course but they 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 can't they need they need basically corn and soybeans and with things of that nature they can live on byproducts which we won't use but basically their, their digestive tract competes with ours whereas sheep cattle uh, bison and other goats um, can live on grasslands and we can raise vast amounts of feed without competing for human food. 
I think that's the way that's the appropriate thing to do. Plus, when we can do that, it can be perennial pastures, which do which do not cause the erosion, or if it's managed right, it does does not need the herbicides, the way of course uh, 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 plowed ground does. I mean, you know, and when you're cropping, so that's where I wanted to spend time. And the more I learned about it, the more it confirmed what I had originally, you know, as a, as a novice had this generalized concept. I know what's going on now. And it's, to me, it's, it's fully defensible. Are there any uniquely American, you know, when you compare the industry between us, Australia, New Zealand, are there any especially American problems uh, yeah. that we deal with that other places don't? What are they? Our, our de- definition of lamb, which okay. drives everything. Everyone knows, you know, uh, I was just at a, a, a lamb, well, lamb show, which is uh, here in Douglas County, Oregon, is the outgrowth is a, kind of a split off from the county fair. So, you know, it was it was set up years and years, many years ago when the lambs would normally come due. So, it, which is in June. And the winning lamb on the show is 160 pounds, 160 pound lamb. And don't tell me that's the same type of animal as a 90 pound or a hundred pound lamb. And the reason it can be that is because our definition in the United States of lamb is different than anywhere in the world. Everywhere else, most everywhere, New Zealand, Australia, England, define lamb by the the first two te- the first adult teeth that appear, which are we call a two tooth, but when they appear, it's 12, 13 months. They, you know, the the the, the baby teeth are lost, and, and the two center teeth come in. And every year after, you get a four tooth and a six tooth, and you have a mature mature animal after three years. But that's what defines lamb everywhere else, more or less. So therefore, you're going to have a lamb that's going to be under a year old. Right. In our case, we define lamb by the break joint, which is when the, you have a hanging carcass and you have the basically an elbow, or the equivalent of an elbow. And what they do is you can break it. I mean, you, you know, obviously, it's a carcass at this point. <laughs> it's right. not. And if it that joint is cartilage when the animal is young and it ossifies as the animal gets older. So if it, it snaps smoothly, that animal is still lamb. When it's when it shatters, it's it's become bone. It's now mutton. We don't even have a separate individual, independent thing where a lot of places do. Then the thing is, is that that doesn't occur till 16, 18, 20 months. So you can have a 15 month old animal that's classified as lamb. We call it in the field, uh, old croppers. They're yearlings they're, and they're short yearlings. And they may be longer yearlings, depend on when they break. And so, therefore, you can get an animal that is 12 months old and goes out to pasture and puts in a feedlot and can still put on 50 pounds. So you can have a 180-pound, quote, lamb. And that's what we're selling. And, and that was done probably so that no other countries do it, so the, the, the packers don't have to compete, I mean, with, with imports as much because they've got a product that's not the same. There's a whole historical thing going on there but the bottom line is we're selling animals that can be called lamb from anywhere from 85 pounds to 180 pounds well you can see what happens in a supermarket not a supermarket but a, but a, but a grocer or something like that opens up a package and you got loin eye areas that are huge and small all in the same box they're all called lamb that does not happen elsewhere and it's a different product i don't care what people say a, a, you know, an 18 okay. month old, 150 pound animal is not the same as grass fed animal coming off grass at 80 pounds, uh, at 100 pounds. That's a very, very big deal. And the thing was, is we don't have an intermediary classification. We have lamb and then mutton. And you know what the prices are. You go to mutton, it's almost nothing. It only goes to pet food, right? Whereas in over other places, they've got that yearling classification. It's called a hogget. So, and I love hogget. I mean, but it, you know what it is. You know, it's a, it's a yearling. It's bigger cuts. It's perfectly fine. It's it's not the same as a nine year old you. Right. <laughs> but we don't differentiate between a ni- a nineteen month old animal and a nine year old call call you. So, and that's you know that's in the commercial world. That's a very, very big deal. And of course, it drives our, our, our people raising things in large numbers. I mean, not a hobbyist, but people who have 500,000, 5,000 animals. I mean, they're moving lamb, they're moving whatever, and they have to get that lamb price. They can't get mutton price. 
So I've seen, uh, you know, Cornell Goat uh, Industry Update 2022. They were talking about echoing what we've heard for years now, which is overall sheep and goat production in the United States is continuing to drop. Although on the same token, imports from Australia have gone they doubled since 2020. I mean, they're going through the roof. Are they just producing a better quality meat or are they producing something that's more palatable, you think? And and how do I, we, I, do you think that'll continue to happen? Is there some, is there something that's going to have to change in order for these numbers to start going back up? And do you think that's realistically going to happen? Well, firstly, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, take a look at, at, at what our industry is like. We got five million sheep in the in the country. A lot of those are uh, at this point a lot fifty percent, what forty fifty percent of our domestic product is going to non traditional to non traditional markets. You know the, the, the Muslim trade and etc. And that leaves not that many sheep. <laughs> we're not we're not selling that many sheep. We right. blew it years and years ago. We had a chance when the wool when the old wool act was finally not going to be renewed. This was back in the late nineties. Yeah, 94, 97, somewhere in there. Yeah, and, and there was a vote taken uh, whether or not to put a put a, a checklist, a, ch- a check off. And there were going to be a check off on imported as well. And the vote passed, but there was some irregularity. So they ran the vote again and it lost. The importation was a big deal. At that point, we had about, uh, I don't know, nine, 10 million sheep. Now we got five. The fact is, you know, in, 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 eight, in 1945, we had a peak of 55 million sheep. But there was, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, including the use of wool in, in military uniforms. But back in 1840s, there were 6 million sheep in New York State. There were more sheep in New York than there are in the country right now. Yeah, I think 1867, there was 45 million. You know, I mean, it, it, it was still, you know, it, do you think that when we switched from wool to synthetic fibers, do you think that was essentially the death blow? Because, I mean, most people, no. No. would you say that meat was kind of a byproduct of the wool no. industry? No. 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 Once okay. they got refrigerated uh, rail cars, meat was not a byproduct. Gotcha. You know, you can move you can move things around the country. And of course, by the 1920s and 30s, you can move it without even thinking. You just like today. No. I mean, if you take a look at wool prices, unless you're selling fine wool. OK, that's that's. A, but if you're selling coarse wool or medium wool, that's not a product. That's not a product you can live on. All right. Well, how, how much wool is, is produced on a, on a you nine, 10 pounds at the most. Right. All right. And you get what? One thirty a pound or something. Can you double it? No. You got a 130 a pound in 1920, plus or minus a little bit. I mean, that's not very much. And how much does it cost you to get that? Let's say you produce 10 pounds, which would be a lot. 10 pounds of, of, of raw wool, which is like about five pounds of, of, of fiber. But 10 pounds of raw wool at a uh, dollar dollar thirty a pound, if you get that, mm-hmm. you know, what do you got? $13 gross revenue off of you? How much is lamb gross revenue? And okay, let's say you get $13 gross revenue. How much does it cost you to share how much, how much, and, and when you got a wool animals going into a barn, so your barn is more humid. And what happens if you got a cast sheep? You have to go out there and, you know, animals turn upside down and they turn, turn turtle. The costs of that wool are real, whether we recognize them or not. Whereas if we we're doing lamb, we could double the production of lamb with increasing lambing rate. And certainly we can increase by 50% often. We can save more. And we can market it differently. I mean, wool, how much do you market? Unless you've got a specialized, of course, colored wool. That's a whole different trip. But if you regular coarse wool, and now we have land, now we have breeds, Katad in particular, and some other breeds as well, that are, they're hair sheep that are more parasite resistant. Hello. <laughs> right. So, I mean, wool's a wonderful product. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's great. I wear wool all the time, including super fine merino wool which i got on sale in new zealand a couple of years ago which was whoa that's really cool i mean it feels like silk next to your skin it's wonderful but lamb is where where for most people who especially small producers lamb is what we do uh, unless you have a very specialized market for wool which could be colored wool which is fine and very very can be very profitable but on the countrywide thing you know, it's it's fine wool that, that, you know, in the big Western flocks, it's going to be uh, at least Rambouillet type wool. Yeah. Do you see a continued shift then to the hair breeds? You know, if you were to, yeah. if you're looking forward in 20 years. Yeah. Okay. And, and I mean, then that, that just makes sense. You, you know, there's a whole, I mean, I love wool and I, I put myself partly through graduate school shearing sheep. Um, um, but hair sheep is, if you're trying to make a serious profit and you look at it like a business person, you go, okay, what are my costs? What are my potential markets? 
What can I do with this? Do I have a market for it? Et cetera, et cetera. Hair sheep is where, unless you have other reasons, hobbyists, uh, if you're doing 4-H thing or something like that in a commercial sense. And that's the people I would only work with. So we talked Com- about, you, you brought up breeds and I know you and I had talked on the phone and I had mentioned specific breeds. There's a lot of folks out there on the internet that are saying, this breed is worm resistant. Do you think people pay too much attention to breeds specifically and not enough attention to genetics? Breeds are something you can see. I mean, Bakewell in the 1700s laid the groundwork on that. The first American breed was George, George Washington's farm created it. You know, we've gone back with breeds, but that was, that was very important before we had a lot more science. And it is still important because you can identify, you got the phenotype, you can look at the animal and go, oh, that's, that's a Suffolk, that's a Lincoln, that's whatever. And there's, metabolic differences between them. But if you're in no nonsense business, why would you be selling purebreds unless you had a purebred situation? All right, that's a specialized market. But if I have 2000 sheep and I'm trying to make my livelihood on it, what I want is high producers. I don't, and a purebred breed by definition doesn't have hybrid vigor unless you use an opposite ram, which is great. You could do that. But usually crossbred animals, they're more vigorous, et cetera, et cetera. You've got more flexibility if you don't worry about which breed. I'm talking commercial here. If someone is selling purebred animals, that's what they're breed. But a commercial situation, you can you can get more than a 200% lamb crop, very vigorous, vibrant animals, very good in terms of surviving and, if necessary, parasite more resistance by crossbreeding. Now, which breed do you choose to do that? We've got a lot of science knowing that. On the other hand, I've gone to a lot of shows and I've watched rams walk across a, a show ring. They would not make a cut in a commercial thing. They can't walk right. There's something wrong with it. And, and, you know, that whole world has gone off in a different direction. Yeah. We and have lambs that they're, they're obsessed about the leg wool. Uh, you know, they're like, they, you and, know, and explain to me, someone explained to me by looking at an animal, you could tell her that she's going to give twins and it's going to be a good mother. Right. You can't. That's the same technology that we were using in county fairs in 1830. And that's what we're basing it on now. We know more than that. You've really come up in a very interesting time. The changes that you've seen in technology, our understanding of genetics and things like that, since you went to grad school to now, is oh, yeah. it's mind-blowing. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, would you say, reflecting back on your tenure in the industry, is that the most major change that you've seen is our understanding of genetics or is there anything no. that really stick what sticks it's out metabolism to you? well now we have we have ability to do genetic tracking and things like that and you know but no we have better understanding of nutrition and metabolism we also have a much better understanding of how pastures grow I mean, take a look. For example, if you go to any fact sheets, you just pick it up anywhere. You know, pick up fact sheets. I don't care if it's NRCS, extension, a company's fact sheets. When they say, here's a pasture, all right, and here's your kind of your species structure, all right, what are your normal recommendations? Put the animals on at nine inches, take them off at three inches. Sometimes you'll see that. Everyone's seen that, okay? So you take that, and that's a recommendation. So I have a question. I have a pasture. I've got 50 ewes. I'm going to put them on a pasture, or rather, let me ask you a simple question. How many inches does it take to meet the nutrient requirements of an early lactation ewe with twins? I don't know. Well, that's the problem, is that by not knowing that and kind of, kind of having the deer in the head like look, you know, <laughs> what? Right. How can you answer the question that says, I've got 50 ewes, three acres, how long can I put them out there for? Because... When we are doing diets, what do we do it on? How much the animals eat? And then have the package and then put your nutrients in that. The thing is, is that's by weight. They eat, you know, four pounds a day or three, whatever it is. Well, why shouldn't we do the forage, the pasture recommendations based on how much is out there in terms of weight? If you know how much is out there in terms of weight, dry matter, right. then you can say, okay, if my ewes are eating four pounds a day, they got small ewes and they're eating four pounds a day, and I've got 50 of them, I can know how many pounds the flock is going to eat, and therefore I can make an estimate of how many days that particular paddock is going to ha- hold them. We have, yeah, the best grazers are doing that now, but that's where 25, 30 years ago, that's what they were doing in New Zealand. I went to people who went to New Zealand, came back into the discussion groups, and they said, well, the thing they noticed was the in New Zealand back in the early, in the mid 90s, that the best, the tool that they had, that the farmers there worked the most part, work with, was a calculator. How quaint, but nonetheless. Right. right. But so, you know, it's not so much what breed animals have, it's how you're going to manage them. And if you have a feed source, 
which it hopefully is pasture, how are you going to manage the pasture? And that we've come a long way. That has been revolutionary since I started back back then. And now what we do, serious, serious pasture management, people who know what they're doing, I don't care if it's sheep, cattle, or bison, goats, mm-hmm. the concepts, we, we now have the tools. We didn't have the tools 30, 25, 30 years ago. We right. do now. Do you think weather has a more significant role in grazing and livestock production now, or is it just because it's in our face all the time in the news? I mean, well, it's, it, always, it's, it's always, we always have to deal with weather. The weather's changing. Right. What we're seeing is as, as plants encroaching in areas where we never saw them before. We're seeing more longer dry periods, et cetera, et cetera. You know, things are changing. I mean, yeah, it's in our face because it's changing and partly because of the obvious change. But no, we have to deal with things. I mean, they're thinking of growing grapes in England for, for wine. <laughs> what? <laughs> but from a practical point of view, I mean, we have parasites for longer periods on right, pasture. Right. Uh, we don't have the rains when we when we traditionally used to. There's more variation. And then you get the big storms that we have more of than we had before. As farmers, ranchers, you always, you deal with change no matter what. Right. There's more of it now. So, well, you just you do it. I had a few more specific questions when it came to grazing and plant matter, things like that. Uh, recently, I've been reading numerous articles where they were talking about certain legumes can have a direct effect on breeding soundness. I've read some articles about clover having negative effects on breeding soundness of ewes. Can you tell me anything about that? Have you yeah. heard that? Well, that's an old thing. Not clover, it's red clover and subterranean clover, which most people don't grow, but they may, they sometimes can possibly have it, phytoestrogens in them. It's been around. It's not new stuff. And it's overblown because we have no, no lab in the United States that tests for it, so we don't know. So, yeah, but would that be a reason I wouldn't grow clover? No way. That would be crazy. Firstly, a lot of stuff is overblown. Secondly, it only affects ewes, for example. If I had a field that was heavily red clover, the only time I'd really seriously worry about that would be the six weeks prior to putting the ram out. It affects how the sperm can be viable when it enters the ewe. Okay, well, knowledge is power. If you know the details about that, you can manage for it. It's like, well, I'll never graze alfalfa because it causes bloat. Well, you're crazy because we can manage around that. We can manage around sorghum Sudan grass and its potential for cyanide or nitrates. We know how to manage it. If you read online, you get all scared and you never touch things. That's crazy. Yeah, don't don't eat hemlock. That's a good idea. But you know, but we got other things out there that we can graze and we know how to manage around it. And sure. we, we know these things. I mean, I see a Facebook post and someone says, I how how are you feeding minerals? And you get 70 responses and they're all over the map. Maybe 55 of them are wrong, flatly wrong. Or typically someone who's responding could be in Michigan and the person is asking it is in New Mexico. How do you make the inference? But people aren't scientists, so they don't, you know, they just say this works for me. Therefore, it's going to work for you. No, that's not the way things work. Seriously. So get good information. And we talk to our viewers a lot about being good consumers of information, you know, good quality information and wading through some of the more uh, problematic stuff that's out there. Well, here's a simple thing. Learn how to do a Google search to help. For example, when you type in stuff in Google and everyone in the world knows how to use Google, after you put your search terms in, skip to a space or two and then type site colon edu or site colon gov that will immediately limit the search to domains that are educational which okay it won't be your sales pitches or you won't be your blogs it'll show up things that you can better trust all right that's a good start that's just a start but at least you have a tool to do I, there is something i do want to say and i think it's the most important thing of all i mean we talk about breeds we're talking about various things like that but i am a nutritionist and over the years the one thing that i have clearly to me drives everything is a decision every sheep producer makes every sheep producer makes well if they have if they're lambing anyway if they're bought and sold lambs and put them on pasture put them in feline it's different but anyone who's got use every producer makes it when do you lamb? I lamb in January. Okay. Every producer, every shepherd who has used makes that choice. I'm not saying January, but somewhere in the year they're going right. to lamb or twice a lamb, whatever. When you make that choice of when you're going to lamb, you've defined the entire nutritional calendar of the year, yes, right? Absolutely. And looking at the nutrition of ewes, their highest requirements are in, during early lactation. And they're even higher when you have twins or triplets, all right? Yes. Their second highest is late pregnancy. That means when you lamb defines when the 
you need the best quality feed. If you define this and if you decide to lamb in the winter, that means you have to have high quality feed at a time it's not growing. Okay, that's a, that's fine. You could do that, obviously. But right. you're making that choice and recognize that you're struggling with getting that, storing that, finding it, buying it, whatever the case may be, but you got to have it. If you make it at a different time, say in early spring, you still got your late pregnancy you got to deal with, but when you get to lactation, new stuff is growing. If you have the market, if you've got the breeds, I mean, all that factors into it. But when you make that decision, you have to make it very, very carefully. And the one thing that we have as sheep producers and goat producers over the cattle folks is that we've got a period of about 15 weeks in the calendar year where they're where the animals are on maintenance the lambs are gone they're not pregnant they're just eating feed and jumping fences okay right. during that period you can do a lot and then that gives you a lot of flexibility to move your lambing date plus or minus wherever you want to do it you can wait two months one year whatever the case may be right where cattle can't because they're either pregnant or or, or lactating or both their entire life once they stop being heifers. There is no, there is no blank period. That, to my mind, is the most important, regardless of breed, regardless of every, the most important because your feed requirements, 65, 70, 75% of your whole budget has to do with feed. I don't yeah. mean the out-of-pocket expenses for minerals. I mean, the land that you're, the fencing to put the animals out there, the barn to store stuff, all the labor. All the times you're moving manure and stuff like that and, and, and cleaning the barn. All that really has to do with feeding animals. When you're going to feed them and what you're going to feed them is determined by their production needs, their nutritional needs, which is very predictable. And the key point is when they land. Speaking about minerals, I see these buffet-style mineral feeders. What is your thoughts on that? They don't I, work. Okay. And and so I'm going to give you my thoughts, and I want to know if I'm barking up the wrong tree or not. The people that do the buffet-style mineral feeders tell me they're like, the animal can tell what they need, and they're going to eat what they need. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, well, those are buffet cafeteria style. So the, the sheep or cattle or whatever could be dying of magnesium tetany, and you could put magnesium oxide out there, and they're not going to eat it. They're not going to eat it. What there is nutritional wisdom is animals will seek out salt and eat it. Yes. And they've got very complex metabolic systems to prevent overeating or get rid of the extra stuff like that. And hunters have known that forever, you know, put a salt lick will attract deer. And so salt is one. The other one is lead. Oh. At certain times of the year, wild turkeys will avoid the use of lead at all costs. Really? That is very interesting. Well, lead bullets. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, okay. you, got me, you got me on that one. <laughs> I just was waiting for that one. Any case, no. But in all, in a, from a nutritional point, <laughs> from a nutritional point of view, uh, yeah. uh, it would that be salt is the one. That's true. And what we do is we use salt in a in a in a complete mixture as the driving force of the intake, which is important because if people are and to recognize that because if people are feeding, you have a mineral mix out there and you got some salt in it, right? And you got selenium and you got all the things you need, cobalt, iodine, whatever. You got that in there and they're supposed to lick it, whatever. But then you're feeding some sort of supplement. Let's say you go to the store and you get this show ring supplement or fattening supplement or whatever else. And you're adding that to the to the hay or whatever. And that supplement has salt in it. What's going to happen to the intake of this free choice stuff? It's going to diminish because they'll get the salt right. out of it. And right. if you depend on that for a wormer, if you mm -hmm. depend on that for ionophore, like Bovitec, mm -hmm. what's your your th your whole uh, intake is going up and down, added to the variation in the f in the flock itself, or some animals more than others. So if you're if you got ten percent of your flock not getting enough of anything, and you show up, with, let's say you have sixty ewes, and you got six ewes down with selenium deficiency, I mean you'll notice that. So how do you approach your minerals? Are, do you glean as much information as you can about the specific piece of property? No, no, no. no. That you go crazy because we've already tested that. If it tested it here over the course of a growing season and tested trace mineral uh, amounts in the thing and they bounce all over the place not so much calcium and phosphorus well uh, sometimes i've seen calcium lower than it should be quote should but there it is you know the grasses didn't read the book you know all right. of a sudden something else is going on there all right fair enough but i've seen manganese copper iron bounce all over the place for example we get really excited for copper 
copper toxicity, chronic copper toxicity in sheep for good reason. And that depends on molybdenum and sulfur and iron in the in the whole in the diet. But sheep uh, ewes will have a requirement somewhere between seven and eleven parts per million of the whole diet. I've seen in a same plot of land and testing like every few weeks mm -hmm. over the course of a growing season, I've seen this the copper levels go from eight or nine, which would be wrong. Oh great, that's wonderful. To twenty Whoa. and then down to four over the course of a season. Wow. So which one are you going to believe? Right. Wow. And then f figure the interactions that happen with other things going on, not to mention the fiber that it could stick to going down the gut. All right. That's we use that in laboratories all the time, but that can happen in the gut. You got a, basically a cation exchange capacity thing issue going on of minerals sticking to fiber as it goes down. So therefore not being able to be absorbed. So all this stuff is going on. So what we do, what I recommend is put out a good, trace mineral mixture that has whatever one is salt or something like that plus a lot of other stuff and it depends on the area some areas like colorado doesn't need a lot because they have high ph soils and they've got higher levels of stuff in in the forages whereas most of the rest of the country does not so you're going to get areas that selenium deficient iodine deficient that are cobalt deficient so those are it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Make sure that they're in the minerals. Right. And selenium should be as high as possible. We have a limit in free choice minerals of 90 parts per million. It's the only mineral. It's the only nut nutrient that's governed by the FDA. You ever think about that? No, I haven't thought about it. Oh, well, everybody, but everyone has to deal with it. We right. can put as much iron in a mineral or, or iodine as we want to, depending on toxicity issues, but we have no regulations about it. All right. But selenium, we do. Why? I'm, sh I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, because way back in the 19... 1940s, I think it was, there was experiments done with selenium uh, where they fed a lot to rats and they got increase of hepatic cancers, liver cancers. Back then, selenium was not considered very much of anything. It was it was, it was toxic. We already knew that. And there was no concept that there was, it was a necessary thing. Although when I first, when I first took nutrition way back when, white muscle disease, uh, you know, was, a, was an issue in New York state. And the way I was told by my, by the instructor, by the professor was, oh, you could help solve that by bringing hay in from Nebraska. Okay. Well, Nebraska is high selenium areas. So we, we didn't know what we were doing, but you knew that hay from those areas, if you fed part of the, your diet with that, it's like, you know, eating the bark of, of a, of a willow tree because you have pain because you didn't right. know the difference, but right. bark contains aspirin. You didn't know aspirin, right, right, right. <laughs> All right. So then in the 1950s, the federal government passed a law called the, the Delaney Clause, which is governs a lot of nutrition. And the Delaney Clause says that anything that causes cancer can't be in a human diet, can't be added to a human diet. Well, yeah, made sense for our knowledge of the 1950s and our ability to detect things. We did ability, you know, our laboratory, we could do parts per million. Now we could do parts per trillion or billion at least. In any case, it wasn't until 1972 that we found out when the science found out without absolute certainty that selenium was required nutrient because they found out that selenium was part of a molecule called glutathione peroxidase, which is in your blood, right. antioxidant type of thing. Well, right. that proved, yeah, that proved that selenium was a required nutrient. But we, now we have a real problem because it can't be fed <laughs> because of the law. And it wasn't until the 1980s that they put it in. It, they allowed, finally could pass it at one part per million. And then that didn't really work because on paper it should have because you got normal variation among animals. You still were getting problems. So they upped that to 0.3 parts per million. And, and along with that in the in the minerals, it's, it was listed for 90 parts per million of free, free choice mineral. And 120 for cattle without quibbling about that those those are the so it's in there now so what you that's the only reason that selenium is is listed uh, i mean is governed by regulations the others are not 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 by amounts you know how much you can put in bottom line is though in most around around the country a, a trace mineral mix that's got that normally will have stuff in it may or may not have calcium phosphorus depending on the company and what they're doing and you know, if, are you feeding it with 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 legumes you're feeding it with grasses you're feeding you know because the legumes and grasses so might have different different amounts of those main minerals. But the others, you just make sure you get the others in there and you have selenium to the maximum, which is 90 parts per million, unless there's a reason for not. And you feed it 24-7. You have it out there so the animals can get it. There's no law 
that says you only need one feeder. You, if you got problems, you can put two feeders out there. I mean, things like that. You you deal with it, and you deal with it in a way that it becomes a no brainer. The issue, and you can always measure how much they're eating by putting out. You know, just taking a measurement when you first put it out, weigh weigh it ten days later, see how much disappeared, divide it by the number of animals. So so you can figure things out like that. But putting out a cafeteria style, you're just looking at problems. The animals do not know which they need. No matter what the science, the science is not there. Now I know Fred Provenza, who's a very, very well-known nutritionist out of uh, Utah, says that animals have animal wi- and nutritional wisdom, and he's dealing in range country. You got range country; animals are walking around eating different plants as right. opposed to a pasture where they're you know, mowing the thing. That's right. a whole different trip. So your books, I'm going to kind of wind things down here. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. A lot of the topics that you talked about today, as far as pasture management, you talked about minerals and weighing minerals and things like that. Can our viewers get all of this information oh, yeah. through your books? So that yeah. would, that's where we need to send them is to the book. Yeah, uh, with a little bit of humor. And and the books are not they're they're not textbooks. You know, a textbook lists in a very very textbooky way. Right. And in and in passive tense, you know, what you'd expect. And should, they should. That's what a textbook's about. And they're like the SID manual, the sheep production manual, the green book, I is got the it. best we've got, if you can still yep. find them. And yeah. Okay. That's no nonsense, but it's not nice bedtime reading. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I did a lot of the background work on those things. Did you really? Oh, yeah. It's heavy oh, yeah. reading. It's heavy duty reading, I'll tell you. No, it's wow. a heavy book. <laughs> <laughs> don't drop it on you, you when you're reading that book you need to wear work shoes with iron yeah. front you know the, the, the just in case you right. drop it no right. seriously it, it, that's a good book and it's and it's based on good science and etc right. um but it's most people don't have it they'll get other books the right. this work for me the, the old sheep book was was very good but uh my books are collections well they're 80 essays all of my ar- articles I mean, they're, they're whatever I chose to do them, and they were rewritten for the books and then copy edited, which is excruciatingly hard when you have a copy editor. Just imagine the worst nightmare of an English teacher. <laughs> okay. All right. But right. nonetheless, they, and it's got indexes. They've got indexes, so you can see things, you know. But each chapter is, is you know, 1,500 words, maybe 1,000, 1,500 words. It takes a few minutes to read. But they're collected in, in groups so that, you know, they're about minerals or they're about energy or they're about lambing, that type of thing. And there's a lot of digestible. Is it pretty digestible for the average person? Absolutely. Think? It was written. It was written for the Shepherd magazine. And someone has told me it was the best bathroom reading they ever had. <laughs> I don't know how to use that in marketing, but nonetheless, right. um, they're very they're very readable chapters. Uh, I mean, you go online, you could see some reviews right there in Amazon, of course. And the books are both in in hard copy, you know, trade paperback, and 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 also as Kindle. So no, there it's very readable, and, and it's meant to be very readable because my my philosophy is that people will learn things when they've enjoyed the reading and it's a story. Yes. And and that if they can remember it, they can use it. And the way they can remember it is they've enjoyed reading it. Right. And it was palatable, if you will. It was something that, oh, yeah, I could read. You know, a high school kid could read it. And it makes sense. Yeah. As you move forward into retirement, do you plan on staying active in the in the industry? Are you going to continue to write? Are you going to continue to do interviews? Are you just going to kind of scale it down? Or are you, are you well, just I'm going scaling to kind it of... down? And I just returned this past week. This last week, I was at the Animal uh, American Society of Animal Science meetings, which are the scientific meetings once a year. I mean, right. you know exactly what you know those type of meetings are like. No one smiles, oh, yeah. and they <laughs> and it's all jargon, and it's scientists talking to scientists. If you want to put someone to sleep, that's a good way of doing it. But right. it, you know, for a week, it was some pretty interesting things that are going on relative to you know research and a lot of graduate students presenting their material and mm-hmm. uh, it was it was exciting to be in science to to talk like that with other scientists and then my moral has been always at least in my professional career is to take that basic good science and make it understandable that which can be used and applied in a practical sense and so people can make good decisions right that aren't just this work for me from somebody else, which may be good or may not be, or may kill animals. I've seen I've seen recommendations that have been wrong, and just that thing about the the, the clover. If you 
heard that, you go, I'm not going to ever use clover. Clover, firstly, which clover? Right. So there are a few out there. Right. I mean, and also you would be, you know, refusing to use a tool that's so important because clover can grow where alfalfa won't because it's grow a lower pH in wetter soils. Mm-hmm. And it's and it comes up faster and, it, and you can actually spread the seed on the ground. Right. Yeah, we can frost seed it here really well. Uh, and red clover is perfect for frost seeding. Yeah. So they're little ball bearing seeds. They fall into the thing, right? And if you heard online or from somebody or read something, oh no, this is bad stuff. You would not be able. You would you would deny yourself a tool that could be extremely useful if managed correctly. Right. Okay. And for example, if you have an issue with uh, red clover, you think of red clover and you, you can't get it tested and, and you don't know if it's a problem or not, yeah. put some weathers out there. And if they start to bag up, you go, right. oh, well, I think there's some estrogens in that thing. Right. And we've never had a problem. We, you know, I just read it and I thought, huh, this is, this is interesting. So when is the new book due to come out? Momentarily. <laughs> I'm actually seriously, not, not this moment, but within, a, within two months, I'm hoping, because I'm, uh, stuff is going to go to the indexer this week. Oh, wow. And then that's everything else has been put together. Yeah. And will that uh, go on Amazon immediately? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, All right. These are being self published in the sense that I'm the one behind it, but I'm working with companies that, you know, kind of a la carte pull thing, you know, do the stuff and they sure. load it up and they know I'm not going to sit there and try to untangle the programming of, right. of trying to untangle Amazon's instructions. No, no. These are what p- companies do, but it's up there. They'll, the two that are up there right now are are, are, are selling all over the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're selling in England, in New Zealand, Australia, uh, Brazil. I just got uh, real royalties from Brazil, Japan, Germany, France, Italy. Yeah. Wow, that's well, great. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of impressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they're selling and, and I've got good reviews. Uh, and it should be. I hope. I'm glad. It's a lot of work to put a book together, by the way. Oh, yeah. But the I thought, you know, there's good material. I remember when I used to use them as handouts. My, my articles as handouts in classes I taught. And a couple of ranchers have said to me, you know, these are really good. I've learned stuff. And I'm thinking, well, oh, that's nice. And then I thought about it and said, but they disappear in a magazine. But in a in book form, they're there for anybody, even if I don't know them. And I've spent a lot of time in doing this, and I've produced two so far. And the third one is is going to be coming out in the next month or so. Everything takes a little longer relative to getting things out, but it's done, except for the index. And that once that index is done, it's, you know, I'm getting a professional indexer. I I did the index for the last two, and I've heard of cruel and unusual punishments, and that's one of them. But once that's done, then it'll go up on it'll go it'll it'll be published, and and it'll be up on Amazon and other places as well. Premier is carrying them, you know. There's there's they'll be available. And you have a website as well, which is yeah, easy to remember because it's WoodyLane.com, correct? Yep, awesome. it certainly is. Awesome. And, well, we and there's will... descriptions in more detail. Although Amazon gives pretty good descriptions because you can they click do. on the picture and you get look inside and you can see the table of contents and the index <laughs> and a couple of you know a few pages to read. So right. you know you get get a handle on on stuff. Yeah, we will make sure that we put all of your contact information as far as the books and your website in the description of the video below. I could talk to you for hours, uh, but we're at an hour and I think we've we've done well. I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today, Dr. Lane. Um, and hopefully sometime in the future, uh, I may reach out to you to interview again. So Be happy to, Kim. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure being on and, and visiting and having this type of, of interaction just as opposed to a, a, a canned webinar. Right. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us again today. We really do appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Dr. Woody Lane. Again, many thanks to him for taking the time to interview with us. If you're interested in purchasing any of his books or would like to contact him, please check out the description below. I'm Tim from Lenosa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again today, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.